good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Kuse. I am a professor at Seattle Pacific University and also a member here at the church. And as I was driving in this morning, I realized this is my 10th anniversary at Bethany, which is uh, kind of exciting. Uh, <clears throat> and so I was tr- trying to think through, and some of you will have to tell me later, but I can't remember if this is the paper anniversary. I can't remember which anniversary it is. But, um, but, it's, but it's, it's been an amazing decade as I was reflecting um, the time that has gone by, which is going to be something I'm going to touch on a little bit later in the sermon. So be thinking about your time here in the community as we get deeper into the sermon today. Um, <clears throat> As we heard from John Wayne last week regarding the last earthly words of Jesus that we have recorded in Acts chapter 1, we are reminded of the journey that we're actually on with the followers of Christ to get us to where we're going to be talking about Acts 2 today in this, uh, this time of Pentecost. You have this promised fulfillment of all the prophets that come in and now Jesus is like riding in in our narrative of the gospels into Jerusalem. He is proclaimed with hosannas and waving of palm branches and this great celebration. But as this begins to die down, another cry from the street starts coming up, which is crucify him. From the, power, from the powers, powers that be in the halls of power to those who used to be followers of him, Things turn almost on a dime in our narrative, and then all of a sudden, that Hosanna becomes crucify him. And then we come to this point with the sound of nails being pounded into a cross on Good Friday, and the words of Jesus, the last words of Jesus that we hear audibly at that moment from Psalm 22, and then it's silence. And then we, again, flip, and women come rushing, proclaiming that he is risen, he is risen indeed. And all of a sudden, now it's rapid fire at the end of the gospel accounts, where all of a sudden there's all these appearances of Jesus. He is the same, but he's even more than the same. He seems to be doing different things, saying different things, but all the same things at the same time. And it's a lot like somebody running around at a party with Polaroids. There's like snapping a picture, you're waving it, waiting for it to come into focus, but just before that's done, there's another shot, and another shot, and another shot, and you're still waving your Polaroids, trying to figure out what is actually happening. Which picture is that one coming into focus. And as Jesus is kind of moving between and betwixt people, we get to Acts 1 that John Wayne preached on last week, and Jesus is saying, oh, by the way, I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to go to the right hand of the Father. I'm ascending to the right hand of the Father, and you need to go too. You need to leave. You need to go to Jerusalem, and you need to wait. And you need to wait. You need to wait. And here's the amazing thing. The disciples actually at this moment did what they were told. (laughs) They did. They left. And they went to Jerusalem and they waited. So in Acts 2 that Megan read for us at this right now, we have these bewildered followers who come into our scene. They have this spiritual jet lag. They have no idea what time it is anymore with all the change going on in their lives. And they come into this festival of Pentecost. Now, it's important to remember the festival of Pentecost is a Jewish festival. This is not a Christian creation. This is a tradition in Judaism called Shavat that was primarily a thanksgiving for the first fruits of the harvest. And so the disciples are coming into this, this already going festival. And it was then later associated with remembrance of the law being given by God to Moses. And so this is an important part of it. But some scholars also talk about this particular Pentecost as a time in the first century where harvests may have been lacking during seasons of drought. Um, So this celebration, this time of celebrating, for some may have not been so celebratory. It may have been a party that you show up at and it was a little bit different, a little bit hollow. So imagine walking in Jerusalem during a big celebration and not only are you feeling loss and grief, But the city seems to be maybe going through the motions as well. And maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you've had a Christmas season at some point in your life where everybody's celebrating, but you just came in after a passing of a loved one or a loss of a job, and it's all this party stuff and major chords, and you're singing in a minor key. Or maybe you came into Easter this year where everybody's celebrating he has risen, but it doesn't feel like he may be even risen that much. For the disciples, that's also their story, remember. They're coming into a place of celebration, but they've lost. They haven't gained anything at this point, right? There's a sense of emptiness that they're coming in, and they're told to wait. They're told to wait. But then as Megan read for us, we hear surprising, wonderful, powerful moments of surprise yet again in the narrative, things that we maybe didn't expect that maybe we should have expected. Where there was darkness and grief of losing Jesus, there's now light in the Holy Spirit. Um, there, where there was emptiness and loneliness, now there's unity in diversity of all these people in all these language coming together in this place with many voices unified with one faith and one Lord. And I want you to hear this point. I'm just going to make a little asterisk footnote here this, on that point. If you want to get to know a big God, 
chase after diversity. Because the many voices, the many languages, the many pictures we're going to give are giving that many more vantage points to how great is this God. Homogeny shrinks God into a manageable size. If we all speak with the same thing, read the same books, hear the same things all the time, God's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the question of Pentecost, as we're going to hear later in the narrative, is that they're chasing after a very big God, not a small one. So unity and diversity has discovered the power of the Holy Spirit is unleashing something powerful for them. Now, volumes have been written across the centuries, literally the centuries, about these tongues of fire, about the birth of the church, Peter's amazing sermon that's going to come after the passage that uh, Megan read for us this morning. But this morning, I want to talk a little bit differently about Pentecost than maybe you've heard before. Because I want to move from the what's happened to what now. I want to move from what's happened to what's now. Pentecost happened. The church was unleashed. And we hear in the later parts of of Acts chapter 2, in 43 and onward, there is this movement that starts to take hold. People are gathering. People are meeting each other. People are explosive in their interest with other. They're sharing everything they have in common. And and here we are sitting at this moment in history, 2,000 years later, as benefactors of an explosive, imaginative, risk-taking church. Universities are being founded over the centuries. We have hospitals. We have the alleviation of global poverty. We have cleaning up of water. We have unbelievable people standing in the ways of injustice and tyranny and oligarchies and racism, and they've stood the test of time because of the fire of the Holy Spirit was in them. We are the benefactors in this church, in this place, because people believed that it was all true. (laughs) And they were willing, because of this power of the Spirit, to do something so unbelievable that they themselves couldn't even see it yet. They couldn't see the event horizon. They had no idea that you would be sitting here. But they knew where they went and what they did and how they did it would change everything. And it has. But as the church moved through time, as the church moved through time from Pentecost, even in the first few decades of the early church, that heat, that fire, started to cool started to dwindle. So the church at Philippi, the church at Colossae, the church at Ephesus, these churches that constitute our epistles that we have in our New Testament, had to remember Pentecost like we have to remember Pentecost. Because they knew it happened, but the what now question had to be asked again and again and again. What do we do with this fire? What do we do with this proclamation of God? What do we do now? While the fires of Pentecost burned hot and bright, it was perhaps easy to understand God's call. But what happens when the heat and the light dim and get cold and dark in the years that follow? How do we remember the fire in our lives? How do we not only recapture that passion, but ignite that fire for the next generation? And that's my question for us this morning. How do we remember Pentecost today? And so to do that, I want to take us to Philippians chapter 2. I want to take you to one of these churches, 60 years, 60 to 65 years, depending on who you're talking to, um, after the events of Pentecost, this young church in Philippi, wrestling with their identity in a multicultural, challenging situation, needs to be reminded of who they are. They need to go back and read their mission statement. What is their vision statement? What are we supposed to do together? How do the fires of Pentecost get fanned back into flame? And so, as we look at this, I want to kind of take a step by step. This will be a little bit more like Bible study a bit in in our this morning. So, if you have a Bible, if you have a Bible app, you can follow along as I as I take you through uh, Philippians two one through eleven. I'm going to read it for us together, Uh, and then I'll be kind of taking you through some verses step by step where I think that God is taking us as a church. So, hear now the word of God from Philippians chapter two, beginning at verse one. Hear these words: If then there is any comfort in Christ. Any consolation from love, any partnership in the spirit, any tender affection and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, have the same love, being of full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but the interests of others. Let the same mind that is in you that was in Christ Jesus who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself, 
became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name so that the name given to Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Will you pray with me as we now open this up a little bit more for us? Holy Spirit, we ask that your flames of love would fall upon us in this text this morning. Open up these words to the church at Philippi so, they, so as they remember the fires of Pentecost, we too in this community can be fanned into flame again. Open your word, Lord, to us powerfully. Ignite with us that, that, that passion that you gave them to be intimately involved with each other and with you. Make space in our hearts to receive you, Holy Spirit, and bind these words to our hearts with hoops that are tighter than steel, we ask in your holy and precious name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Do nothing, have the same mind. This, this first part of reflecting on this, how do we recapture the fire of Pentecost, Paul is talking to this young church amidst this context that he has in Philippi and challenges them on the one hand to have the same mindset with one another that is to be maintained both corporately in our private lives, but also states in verses three and five, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And that word of vain conceit is uh, kenodoxa, which is a sense of vain glory, right? Don't glorify the wrong stuff. Make sure to glorify the right things. Um, so Paul has this master plan for how the church is supposed to remember its mission statement. First and foremost, they've gotta get into deep life together. They gotta make life personal. Be of the same mind. Do not chase after the wrong glories, right? Be of the same mind together. And that means it's a call not merely to look at a safe distance about community, to keep people at a distance, and as we're gonna hear later, certainly don't keep God at a distance. No, this is a radical call to get personal with one another, to literally move into the lives of others and find habitation there, and conversely, to create an expansive space of hospitality within our hearts and homes to allow and encourage others to be part of our family. Now, I come from this distant land called Snohomish County. Um, and up in north in Snohomish County, we have this mythical city called Mill Creek, where I live. Um, and I know for Seattleites, it's like, what happens up north? Well, let me tell you some stories. Um, <laughs> So the mythical land of Mill Creek, which I live, was incorporated as a city in 1983. 1983, first for-profit municipality in the United States of America. It was a for-profit venture when they created the town. We even created a whole myth around the story of the, the mill and everything. I can tell you that later. Um, so I live in Mill Creek, up in Snohomish County. And one of the things about developments that were in this part of the country as it was incorporated as a city, and particularly if you go through suburbs, is something you're going to notice. It's a theme in American architecture around homes, which is this the loss of the front porch, the loss of the front porch. Very hard to find front porches out where I live, right? Um, the front porch we traditionally think of as the place where if you're walking down the street, people in the evenings after their day of work, they're gonna be sitting on the front porch, waving at each other, people will kind of wander over, you ask questions as, as random as kind of what fertilizer you're using, because that looks really good, to I can't believe that you're still using that lawnmower, I'd definitely upgrade. Um, so you have these kind of things that are usually happening as you're kind of sitting on the front porch. Um, and also maybe profound things, like say, hey, I just heard what happened, I'm really sorry, you know, can anything you guys need, you need some food, you need some help, right? There's a kind of sense of life that way. Where I live is a life of the back porches, of the back porches, of the places that are curated and, and, and kept um, away from your view when you go driving by my house. Uh, literally with the advent of this amazing invention called the automatic garage door opener, um, uh, I can drive up when I get home from work, I can push a button and like Batman, I can go into my back cave and it can close behind me and then I can go to the back porch where all my things are curated, which you can't really see, but it's for me right? It's my place. And I get to have my time in my place, in my private property that I now own, which is an amazing thing about our current tax code. Even you are, you are a winner. If you own property, it's been in our tax code for a long time. Um, you get all these benefits by being a private owner of property. And that's been an incredible move for our economic success as a country, but it's also engendered a certain way that people think about what their priorities are. Think about it this way. 
Throughout your week, you are besieged with messages that are telling you that the thing you need to do is not need people in your life. That's the goal of your life. You need to be financially solvent. You need to be healthy. You need to have your act together so you don't have to need another person. Right? That, that's your kind of, you're, everybody's getting to that point where I can just not have to need people. Right? And then we come into churches and we sit down in pews and we're told this gospel about this thing called the church where we're supposed to need one another. Acts 2.42, where we share things in common and we spend all this time together. It's so jarring that it seems like a different universe for an hour and 20 minutes that you dwell here. Because it's not the universe that many people are being trained up to. I think of my students, both undergraduate and graduate students, over years of teaching universities, who have been trained into thinking that their goal in life is not to have to need you. I've got to get to a point where I own things and do things where I don't have to depend on other people because that's the goal. Being a benefactor, that's really nice. But to actually need you, to need help from you, to open my heart to you, well, that's a failure. That's weakness, right? So the message that Paul begins with is a very important message because this is what happened at Pentecost. People discovered that they were not alone anymore. They didn't have to fight to be alone anymore. They didn't have to be these separate entities all the time battling it out to win that one thing, right? It was about unity, not competitiveness. They learned to speak each other's language. They were curious about each other. These were not people I had to win over. These were people who are now my brothers and sisters. Be of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Get deep in the life of each other. Secondly, Paul is challenging this church that faith is about belief as dwelling with Christ and each other. So as we get deeper into life together, how do we maintain that? How do we hold on to that deep intimacy together? How do we help that happen? Well, as we see in verse 5, Paul is calling the church to have the same mind that is in Christ Jesus. There's the key. How do we get deep with each other? We have to get deeper into the love of Jesus. We have to get deeper into that love. Now, the, the term that is used there that is, that is often translated faith in Christ or in Christ Jesus um, is from a root that Paul is using over and over again, pistis Christi, faith Christ, right? And what is that faith Christ supposed to be? Now, while Paul was arguing, what he's arguing for by calling for those Christians to have pistis Christi is to have faith of Christ not merely the faith in Christ. Faith of Christ, not merely the faith in Christ. And let me explain what I mean by that. This shift from in to of is the shift from keeping Jesus as an objective proof statement to being part of your life. If I have faith in Christ, I'm looking over there at this objective truth over there that can be rarefied merely in my brain. It's some kind of thing that, to coin a phrase from the 70s, evidence demands a verdict from Josh McDowell, is that I have enough data points to prove to you through a rational rhetorical strategy that this is true. I mean, it's verifiable in a particular way. And that's a good thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying that's a good thing. But what's happening with Paul is he's saying it's not enough to think about Jesus. It's not enough to agree about him. It's not enough to get to a point of saying, yeah, I think that's true. There's got to be something more to that if you're really going to get deep into the life of Christ. It's going to have to mean that you get closer. My pastor and friend from years ago, Bruce Larson, who was at University Presbyterian Church, used to illustrate this in a powerful way when, when he talked about marriage. He used marriage as an example here. In terms of a marriage proposal, when one asks the question... And how one answers the question makes all the difference in the world. Um, Is the response an affirmation to a truth claim? Or is it a binding situation of will you be in my life? So think of it this way. Um, It's a move from seeing faith as a series of true and false statements to yes and no moments. It's it's, It's the question of the gospel and the hope of the church is not found in true or false statements but yes or no commitments. Will you marry me is not to be met as a response as I believe that question is very important and I therefore say true. Right? That's not how you say when somebody's on their knees trying to give their life to you, right? The gospel is about will you follow me, yes or no, not true or false. Yes or no realities in faith mean are you gonna go with me regardless of the rationality of it? It's not gonna make sense to you. This church that Pentecost encountered was on fire, (laughs) literally fire falling, 
Languages being understood and said. They were radically giving their lives away with such unbelievable potency that they had no idea where it was going to go. They weren't measuring the ROI, the return on investment of what was happening before they made any type of fiscal decisions. They were with reckless abandon following wherever God took them. And that's a yes or no type of relationship. Will you follow me? True. (laughs) No, it's yes or no. Yes or no. So with that then, the church, it's not enough just to merely belong to a church and membership. It's not enough just to say that I like that place or I agree with it. It is to, how do you pour your life into it and how does Christ pour into you? Do nothing out out of vain conceit. Have the same mind, deep life together. Faith of Christ. Have deep, deep love in Jesus to make that possible. And third, we find Christ through what we release and make room for, excavation, not what we accumulate. We find Christ to what we release and make room for, excavation, not what we accumulate. If you're going to have deep life together, be of the same mind. If you're going to have the faith of Christ, deep life in Jesus, you're going to have to make room for it. And I'm going to have to make room for it. I need to make room in my heart for you. I have to make room in my heart for what Jesus is doing. And this space that is being created that Paul is talking about is what the fires of Pentecost were all about. It was burning away those things that prevented you from getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper to be filled, 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 filled with more of what God had in store. It means digging out stuff. It means a big yard sale of the soul. It means clearing out the junk. It means making space to be filled by what God has in store, not other things. And what that means in, in, for Paul in Philippians, uh, in verses 6 through 11, is that the very form of God that Christ is showing us is a unique and powerful type of form. It's a radical form that was created by Pentecost. The word that Paul is using when he talks about the form of God that Christ is taking is morphe Christos, right? Which is the form of God. It's not icon, which is a fixed, static type of form. It is a forming form. It's something that's always changing, like fires, right? It changes all the time. And that means that what's happening is that new things are possible. New things are growing. New spaces are being created all day long. And my question for you is, who is forming you right now? What are the forces and impact factors that are forming your soul right now? How are you being forged? What fires are you submitting yourself to to forge you into a particular shape? And what is that shape doing to you? And how sufficient is it? The Christian Century, a publication that's been going on really since the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, used to have a series of articles titled, How I Have Changed My Mind. How I Have Changed My Mind. Very provocative. And what they do is they invite kind of heavy hitter theologians and biblical scholars to talk about moments when they change their mind. So, I mean, going back in history, we're talking about Karl Barth, we're talking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I mean, these are big names, right? Big people who've influenced our thinking about the Bible and about the life of the church. And they would submit to the article by saying, well, I used to think this. I don't think that anymore. I've changed my mind. If God is gonna do a new thing, and God is gonna bring you through the fires of transformation, there may be things in your life that you need to make space for, which means you're gonna have to let go of one thing in order for the new thing to happen. And what is that new thing that maybe God wants to do in you? What's what's a new idea? What's a new view? What's a new position that maybe you need to take on board that God wants to do in you? That God wants to burn more space for so that you can be filled with that? What is that new thing? So how do we think about what this means? Well, as we think about the fires of Pentecost and what was created, I love, I, I love to center this on um, what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. In his book, Life Together, the theologian and martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer put a sharp point on it by saying, Christ only exists in community. Christ only exists in community. This idea from the enlightenment forward that we have some kind of personal faith, the idea that I have something that you don't get to have, that it's mine, that I own it, it's gonna be pretty hard to find that story in this Bible and in this testimony of the church. God gave the world the church, (laughs) the church, a group of people forged together by the fires of Pentecost to depend on one another, to show this radical love for one another. And it was when people saw how we loved each other, how we cared for the world, how we stewarded our things together, then people began to understand and see the power and potency of God. And that means that we need to start thinking about what is separating us and how we can come back together, how we can be the body of Christ together. 
How can we be formed by the forming form of God, the morphe theo, this, this forming form of the fires of God that wants to bring you into deep and abiding relationship together? And that's a challenge. That's a challenge because that means it's gonna challenge the way we think about our lives. What are the things you're holding onto right now that you consider essentials that maybe the power of the Holy Spirit through Pentecost wants to burn away from you? What are those things for you, right? Ron Sider um, wrote in his book, Rich Christians in the Age of Hunger, this really provocative statement. The church should consist of communities of loving defiance. Instead, it consists largely of comfortable clubs of conformity. A far-reaching reformation of the church is a requisite if it is to commit itself to the mission, Jesus' mission of liberating the press. I'm going to read that one more time because it's pretty potent. The church should consist of communities of loving defiance. Instead, it consists largely of comfortable clubs of conformity. A far-reaching reformation of the church is a prerequisite if it is to commit itself to Jesus' mission of liberating the oppressed. I have mentioned this to some of you in different times, but I'm a... I'm a investigator on a large grant with a Lilly Endowment that I've been working on. It's a 10-year longitudinal grant. I'm six years into it right now, working with young adults. 22 to 29-year-old, that's the target group that we've been working with, up in the I-5 corridor. So I've driven them to a lot of places over the past six years, a lot of meetings, a lot of kind of small groups of young adults kind of talking with me with a recorder, and then we code all the conversations and try to get some meaning from all these conversations. It includes church basements, it includes CrossFit gyms, it includes Zumba classes, it includes being down at Amazon, it includes being down down at a bunch of food trucks down in Portland. Um, and so we've had a lot of these conversations over the years with you know, over a thousand different young adults to have these conversations about. And one of the things we've found in these young adult conversations that's bubbling up to the surface is a lot of young adults, when they talk about faith, they have faith, but they're really not sure about trust. They have a lot of faith, meaning they know that God is real. They know the thing about the church is there. I mean, if you give them a quiz, they know the right answer to say. They have the faith in Christ, but that faith of Christ, it's hard to see the examples of the sustaining power of that in many of their mentors. They don't see how much the faith has cost them. They don't see evidence that they're actually living for that, right? They've been raised to think that they need to go to those right schools. They need to get those jobs. They need to get that private property. They need to get those tax breaks. I mean, these are all good things. I'm not saying these aren't good things, but they are not the thing, (laughs) when it comes to what the gospel is telling us to do. It is about sharing our lives together. It's about giving up space. It's about needing each other, depending on one another, allowing people in to realize that my sin is your sin. Your sin is my sin. Your brokenness is part of my life, right? My loves are your loves. This is the, the, what the potency of the church is. And young adults want to see that. They want to be around trustworthy people who want to love them into the kingdom, to show what it costs to follow Jesus. And when that evidence is so real, so palpable that I can touch and taste it, I'll go there with you. I will go there with you, right? And what's at stake for us this side of Pentecost is this. What does it mean for us to really allow ourselves to lay down which separates us and become the body of Christ? To trust each other, to be together, to live that faith together. So in closing, I want to ask kind of two basic questions for us to meditate as we close our worship together, but also as you go into your week. As you think about the fires of Pentecost, as you think about this early church gathering together in this powerful way that's only possible through God's sustenance, the first thing I want you to think about is what is preventing you from being in deeper relationships with your community at church? What's preventing that? Is it time? Is it priorities? Who are the people who are forming you right now? Who is forming this space in you to be expansive, to receive what the Holy Spirit is? What's preventing that right now? And secondly, how can those things be burned in the fires of Pentecost to free you to receive the people in your life who want to love you, who want to care for you, and a God who thinks you are worthy of that? Because I want, to, I want to end on this point as you think about those two things. What's preventing that forming? And how can those be laid down for the fires of Pentecost to change? And I want to end with this. You are worthy of God's love. You are worthy of God's love. Your unique, unrepeatable miracles of God. The story of Pentecost is the truth of that statement. God loves you so much to give you fire. To give you fire. To burn bright and hot. So you will not be cold again. 
that you will not be alone again, that you will not be isolated again. God wants to provide this for us as a church, wants to show the world how we can love one another. And I hope that's your work together as well. So as the band comes out, as we begin to move into worship, I'd like you to think about those things and pray about those things as we sing together. As the fires fall and want to shape and transform you, what is preventing your formation to receive what God has in store? And how can you lay those things down at the fires of Pentecost, like the Church of Philippi was called to do, to be formed by what God has in store? So let us raise our voices and hearts together in worship as we sing together and prepare our hearts to become the church together. Let's join in worship.